Shakily, I got to my hooves and limped towards the crumbled mess of Zenith. Her scabs had all broken, and she was bleeding horribly again. I drew on the Black Book's spell one last time, in a desperate bid to quell the blood loss. I stared into the blood-streaked screen of my pip leg, using the inventory sorting spell to find the last healing potion I had in my saddlebags. As I fed it to Zenith, I tried to spot Velvet Remedy. Rarity's battle dress should have protected her. She would still be alive. Life Bloom, I realized, had been much closer to the explosion. I was certain that Velvet was searching for him. Dreadfully, my mind imagined Velvet, stumbling and hurt, walking right past the cloak shrouded body of Life Bloom as the unicorn bled out. Hating my mind, I shook off the horrific image. I wasn't going to let that pain or despair stop me any more than I was going to let that free forest or the Wonderbolts win. I had a destiny. I had a mission. I had friends to help and unicorns to save, and a sky to clear. No more self-pity. No more misery. Let the Wasteland and the Enclave throw whatever the fuck they wanted to at me. I made it this far. I'd survived Philadelphia and Canterlot, and that was before I even knew my purpose. How was it going to stop me now? I was going to... be awesome. Yes. That worked. The rational part of my mind told me that if one of the Wonderbolts could do that and fly away, they could probably all do that. And they could just keep doing that until they had all torn us to bloody ribbons, flattening the Everfree Forest in the process, if necessary. I told the rational part of my brain to shut the hell up. The next thing that came shooting down out of the sky was going to get a bullet through its visor before it could pull off any fancy smancy aerial tricks, courtesy of little Macintosh. Soon as I spotted where Applejack's old revolver had fallen, I looked up, trying to spot dive-bombing Pegasi through the large gap in the foliage created by the... whatever the hell that explosion was. Instead, I saw Calamity once again Pegasus fighting with the Wonderbolts. This time, a gunmetal gray buck with an elastic sea green mane and what looked like an anti-machine rifle built into his battle saddle their sniper if there was one good thing about being this close to the fire it was that the thick smoke rendered that bastard's advantage useless he was still a better flyer than calamity and at least damn near as good a shot a familiar blast of sparkling red energy struck out of the forest, enveloping the gunmetal gray Wonderbolt, turning him instantly from a graceful aerial fighter into a pony-shaped sack of fail. Calamity stopped, hovering as he watched another buck drop into the forest, paralyzed by the anesthetic spell. That spell came from Life Bloom. That meant he was okay, and we had now taken down two of the Wonderbolts. I felt the urge to cry out in elation. Instead, I coughed up some more blood. Stumbling forward, I began to search for my friends. My hoof bumped into something solid and metal. Little Macintosh. Thank you, Luna. I felt like things were really beginning to turn around. I found Velvet Remedy. She was fighting to save the life of the albino hellhound with the zebra cloak. Of course she was. The Hellhound was caught in the blast, the Wonderbolts apparently not caring if they destroyed their own tools. His leg had been blown off, his body ending in bloody tatters and shredded meat and broken bone inches above where his left knee should have been. The Hellhound was whippering grudgingly, his body shaken in shock, the grass beneath him wet with blood. When I came upon them, Velvet Remedy was using a stick and a length of old surgical tubing to craft a tourniquet. She does this a lot? Life Bloom whispered, appearing at my side, surprised by Velvet's aid to the enemy. All the time, I replied, shaking my head. Part of me wanted to be mad at her. We had wounded of our own. But what good would it do? 
Velvet couldn't see a creature suffering, and not try to help. It was a virtue. Her virtue. Even if it was, occasionally, damn frustrating. Life Bloom. Zenith, please. I pointed in the direction of the zebra friend, and the Twilight Society unicorn trotted quickly away. Life Bloom was filthy, his cloak and coat smeared with dirt and blood, but he apparently appeared surprisingly unscathed from the explosion. Clemity flew up around me, looking around. Hey, Lil Pip, you see where Gunshot fell to? I shook my head. Gunshot? So, their sniper was the Pegasus who took second place to Calamity in the best young sharpshooter competition four years running. I should have guessed. Well, shoot. Want to get to him before Life Bloom's spell wears off. Boy would have had me if he wasn't so insistent on shooting me. Come again? I gave him a confused look. Gunshot could have taken me down a dozen times over with his fancy flying, but unlike Skydive, he was so fixated on getting the best of me with bullets, he all but defeated himself. I frowned as Calamity flew off, continuing his search. That didn't sound like the sort of rivalry that was going to be fixed with a memory spell. I had dragged myself back to Zenith, and the miraculously healthy Life Bloom. When I reached them, I kneeled before my com comatose friend. Life Bloom had stopped the bleeding and was casting a replenishment spell. How... how bad? We really need to get this girl out of the battle zone, Life Bloom frowned. I'm using nearly every spell I have just to keep her from slipping away. All this extra trauma isn't helping. The unicorn frowned, shaking his head. If she doesn't come to on her own soon, Velvet's going to have to make the call. It took me a moment to realize he was referring to the medical operation, dissolving part of Zenith's skull to ease the pressure on her swelling brain. Velvet Remedy was the only one of us who knew enough about medicine to make an informed decision. Do we risk Zenith's life by having Life Bloom cast the spell? Or do we risk it by telling him not to? How did you survive the explosion? I asked, changing the subject to something I could better handle. I took cover, the unicorn explained. Dove into that hole the Hellhound came out of. One of the Wonderbolts, a cloud-white mare with a flaming orange mane, flew overhead. I recognized her as Skydive the one who had bucked her own contrail and had felled Calamity with her lethal uh, buccaneer blaze. Always front and center of the formations, I suspected she was their leader. She stopped, hovering, then shot up into the air, disappearing into smoke directly above Zenith's huddled form. No. Run! I shouted, wrapping the bleeding, butchered zebra in my magic my brain ignoring that my body was in no condition to gallop. A rust-colored blur shot out of the sky. Calamity had me in his hooves, racing between the trees with strands of gauze flapping in the wind behind him. A moment later, the world behind us exploded in a fiery mushroom cloud. The smoke ring of electrifying storm clouds struck us, lightning sizzling across my body, making me convulse. My magic imploded, dropping Zenith once more onto the forest of, at bone-crunching speeds. Goddesses, at this rate, we were going to kill her. Calamity and I crashed into a large patch of purple ferns, with long, stalked, bulb-headed plants growing out of them. We tore roughly through the plants, fawns lashing out at us like whips, until we slid to a stop. Calamity lying half on top of me. I coughed. Blood spraying on the ferns and grass. My body felt torn up inside. My EFS was sending me several severe internal injury warnings. The plant stalks bulbs, each the size of a stallion's head, languided swiftly down towards us. A magical barrier washed over us a split second before those bulbs broke open, hosing us with clouds of dusty plant matter. Spores. I turned to see Velvet Remedy charging towards us, her horn glowing, her shield having saved us from 
goddesses knew what, horror. The fire remained wonderful, burst out of her explosion, her contrail on fire as she shot towards Velvet Remedy. The bulb-headed plants rotated towards the oncoming unicorn. Their bulbs broke open again and spewed. Velvet tossed up another shield, sliding to a graceful stop. Wonderment splashed over me as I realized just how fast she had gotten with casting that spell. And this was the first time I had seen her manifest two shields at once. My mare's got skills, Calamity grinned, echoing my thoughts as he lay half on top of me, recovering from the brief electrocution. I pushed him off, looking about, hoping that Zenith had either landed away from the spraying plants, or that Velvet's shield had protected her too. The Wonderbolt shot over Velvet, her contrail causing trees to burst into flames in her wake, and soared over us, setting the bulb-headed plants on fire. The burning plants seemed to scream, wither, and collapse, the fire spreading to the ferns all around of us. Something plummeted down from the sky. It wasn't a dive-bombing Wonderbolt. It was more like some sort of missile, a mechanical device sheathed in red-painted metal that embedded itself into the ground with a mighty whoomp. Calamity grabbed me again, flying us out of the bed of ferns, being slowly consumed by fire. He coughed as he inhaled the black smoke bellowing up from them, and the little pony in my head recalled the earlier fears of dangers in the Everfree smoke. As we landed again, I began to heave, coughing up blood in large, wet splotches. Damn it, Lil Pip! Calamity scolded, fishing out a healing potion. I downed the potion, feeling the warmth of its magic spread throughout me. There was a slight hint of peaches and alcohol, telling me that Calamity had purchased this bottle from Candy in New Appaloosa. As the potion started to work, I quickly felt less gruesome inside. The three remaining Wonderbolts flew up, stared down at the strange intruder in our battle. The plate on the missile slid open, a strange-looking turret, with a diamond embedded in the barrel, slid out. It turned, aiming up at, the, at a sky thick with smoke. Velvet Remedy screamed. I threw her a questioning scowl, assuming that something about the mysterious missile had set her off, and did a double-take of the horror. The tree next to her had been set ablaze by the Wonderbolt's fire contrail, licking flames spreading throughout its branches leaving burning leaves falling around her. But that wasn't what had horrified her. The tree was one of those wrapped in grotesque, bulging pack patches of blackish moss. And one of those patches, roughly the size and vaguely the shape of a pony, was ripping itself off of the tree. The moss creature fell onto all fours, looking even more pony-like. But the way it moved, twisted, and boneless, was like something out of a nightmare. At first, I hoped it was just fleeing from the fire, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw more dark, misshapen forms pulling themselves from the trees. Calamity drew the magical energy rifle and fired several bursts into the moss creature as it lumbered towards Velvet Remedy. The creature incinerated colorfully. A clicking whine sounded from the missile, and the turret's diamond began to glow projecting the image of a huge, cybernetic red eye against the smoke. The eye jerked back and forth, seeming to watch us. We all heard Red Eye's voice. Congratulations, Wonderbolts, on an excellent strategy, Red Eye said amiably. Oh yeah, one of the Wonderbolts bucked deadpan. This ain't super villainy at all. Red Eye to the rescue? Calamity whispered to me as a burning leaf drifted past us. Red Eye continued, his voice never straying from a pleasant, conversational tone, as if we were sharing tales over tea and apple slices. Unfortunately, too good. I'm bored. And frankly, I have my own plans for that little unicorn you are tracking. Fuck me. So, I decided to even up the playing field a little bit. The missile let out a pulse, and my EFS alerted me that the Hellhound Control broadcast 
had just been silenced. The Wonderbolt stared from the red eye in the sky to the missile and back. The fiery maned uh, cloud white mare <laughs> shouted, Jet's not here. Situation's changed. Tactical retreat. The Wonderbolts began to fly upwards. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you, Red Eye said calmly, the Wonderbolts stopping as if something had them by the tails. First rule, no flying. First rule, a Wonderbolt buck asked. Fuck that, the fiery maned mare retorted back before flopping her wings and shooting through the smoke, rising through the projected Red Eye in a burst of speed. The other Wonderbolts waited a heartbeat. The moss monsters began to move in on us, with twisted, jerking steps. The Wonderbolts leading mare plunged back down through the smoke, driving downwards, or driven downwards by a dark green olicorn, who slammed her into the ground hard enough to knock her unconscious and nearly kill her. Calamity spun, firing on a moss monster that was getting alarmingly close. It turned to ash in a flash of magical energy. More green olicorns uh, flew down through the smoke, landing in the forest around us. A shimmering red olicorn shield swept overhead, forming between them, trapping us and the Wonderbolts inside. I suddenly felt I was back in the pit. Now, I'm not sensing a whole lot of rescue in this rescue, Calamity muttered as he checked the load on the magical energy rifle. The moss monsters were unlikely to be as vulnerable to bullets. Something fluttered against my thoughts like a bat. I turned about to see the one olicorn inside the shield, standing over the fallen body of the Wonderbolt's leader. Her eyes burrowed into me. I felt her in my mind. The intrusion was intimate and unwanted. You are the one Red Eye wants. Her voice was royal and powerful in my head. Well, I thought back, he can't have me. We shall see. In an instant, her voice was joined by a dozen others, all whispering in my head at once, flooding my thoughts with their voices. They were all green, the daughters of Gestalt and Mosaic. As the tidal wave of voices mounted into a tsunami, I wondered if the green's natural telepathy made them more stable, more capable of coping with the loss of their Trixie goddess, or less. I fought to hear myself think. What were they doing? And why were they helping Red Eye? What did the Alicorns get out of this? What had he promised them? Males, the voice responded, reading my thoughts. Continuation. Survival. Mates. Oh. Clever Stallion. The sea of voices increased, not by dozens, scores. Red Eye had coaxed almost half of the green alicorns to serve him in exchange for the male alicorns he would create as their new god. And most of them were here in the Everfree Forest, at the Cathedral. I heard Calamity fire the magical energy rifle again, but I wasn't seeing him. I was getting flashes of what they were seeing. Muddled glimpses inside the stone walls of Red-Eye's fortress, all overlapping, too chaotic to make any sense of it. Velvet Remedy had moved up to us. She said something about Zenith, but I didn't catch it. The minds of the Alicorns pressing against my brain were making it hard to c keep connected to the real world in front of me. Above us, the Wonderbolts were circling the top of the shield flying faster and faster, their thundercloud contrails spinning spirals behind them as they drew closer with each pass. Above them, Red Eye's red eye shifted back and forth across the clouds of smoke, watching the show. The flood of other thought was becoming overwhelming. Then, suddenly, it focused. Float out your gun, the voices demanded in unison. I found myself levitating little Macintosh. It was such a simple request, after all, and I really wanted to. 
The voices in my head had told me so. Aim at the unicorn. Okay. Wh what? Wait. Velvet? Uh, no. But the pressure on my mind was like a physical force. The weight of a dozen alicorns pushing me to swing the barrel of little Macintosh towards Velvet. Aim at the unicorn. I fought back, the revolver shaking in the air as I tried to assert my own will. But the alicorns were determined to consume my will, submerged uh, it in their own until I was cut off from it completely. In my head, my little pony was fighting a losing battle as dozens of little alicorns swarmed over her, piling up against her like a mountain. Little Macintosh swiveled in the air, its barrel pointed at Velvet Remedy's skull. Little Pip? Velvet Remedy asked timidly, finally seeing the gun floating in a sheath of magic, shrinking back from Little Macintosh. Why are you... Kill the unicorn! Overhead, the Wonderbolts suddenly angled towards each other. They expertly missed colliding in a threesome, their contrails focusing on a focal point perfectly centered above the missile, releasing a star-shaped explosion of electrical energy. Red Eye's projector went dead, his eye disappearing from the sky. At the same moment, my eyes forward sparkle collapsed, my pip legs spell matrix crashing. Kill the unicorn. My little pony was buried under a rising hill of little alicorns, crushing her, stealing her breath. But they weren't the only thoughts pressing my mind. Be strong. Be unwavering. Be smart. This wasn't the first time I had felt the influence of outside entities. The black book. The statuettes. But whatever those outside thoughts bore, good intentions or ill, I had never let them control me. Influence? Yes. But I never lost myself to them. Kill the unicorn. The mountain of little alicorns filling my head blew apart. Their influences scattered as the little pony in my head gave them all a mighty buck. No. I pulled little Macintosh away from Velvet Remedy, firing instead at the alicorn inside the shield. Not gonna happen. Blam! 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 The alicorn was dead by the second shot, but it didn't stop until I had completely unloaded the weapon. Turns out, if you pour enough bullets into a creature's brain, it really is almost like decapitation. Besides me, Velvet Remedy looked shock. She was trembling. No, wait, that was me. The alicorn mines were still in my head, but they were quieter now. One by one, they slipped away from me. In the very last, left a stray thought behind. Tell Red Eye she passed. The intensity of my trembling jumped in order of magnitude. My mind filled with violation, pain, and rage. Splitting at the ground, I let out a primal scream. Movement above caught my eye. Velvet had found Zenith near the edge of the shield, and the three of us had almost made our way to her before I had buckled from heat exhaustion. The others weren't doing much better. Velvet had given me the last of our water after pouring most of it gently into Zenith's mouth. I had taken it without argument, but I was regretting it now. I looked up to see Reggie pounding against the alicorn shield. She had recovered, but was trapped outside. Reggie, you're okay! Clement shouted up to her. His voice cracked and rasping. Most of the trees inside the shield were burning. The Wonderbulls had rebreathers in their armor, but we were dying of smoke inhalation. Of course, she called back. I carry plenty of healing potions. I'm not an idiot. Yeah, what kind of morons would wander into the wasteland without each having their own load with them? Before the griffin could say anything else, that made me question my intelligence. I directed her to start killing the statuesque alicorns sitting just inside the shield. 
And be careful. Clemente warned us between fits of coughing. When the shield goes down, this fire, he collapsed. In a hacking fit that sounded like he was trying to get rid of his lungs through his muzzle. Reggie nodded sagely and flew off. Lifebloom crept over to the unconscious leader of the Wonderbolts, shoving the still breathing, a uh, still bleeding corpse of the Olicorn off of her. Whoomp! The blue armored form of the Wonderbolt dropped out of the curling smoke around us. I recognized her rust colored mane and red coated snout. The Wonderbolt's heavy gunner. I swung little Macintosh towards her, trying to focus through the smoke, stinging my eyes. I'm trying to remember if I had reloaded or not. Damn it. This was just too easy, she said, casually batting little Macintosh out of my telekinetic grasp with her wing. Dark, shifting shapes moved out of the smoke, stumbling towards her. Look out! Clamity rasped as the moss creatures closed in on the Wonderbolt. The Wonderbolt's heavy gunner turned, sprayed pink energy across the black moss creatures, dissolving two of them in flashes of pink ash. The third was huge, a giant shadow towering over her. A splash of icy horror trickled down my spine as I realized the monst moss monster was vaguely manticore-shaped. These, these plant things had once been living beasts, many of them ponies. This black moss infected them somehow, consumed them, became them. The Wonderbolt dodged as the monster lashed out at her with what had once been a manticore scorpion-like tail. It was aiming for her head, trying to get inside the narrow slit in her helmet, which her mane flowed through. The rust-colored mare opened fire, spraying the moss manticore with pink light. Part of the creature dissolved in flashes of ash, but this one wouldn't die so easily. The moss manticore slashed out with its sparkly, startlingly atrocity, raking claw-like appendages against her armor, trying to rip off her visor and get at her eyes. The Wonderbolt staggered, blocking the blows with her wings, keeping the creature off of her face. She fired again, a few beams of pink glancing out before her weapon ran dry. The moss manticore exploded into green flames. The Wonderbolt stumbled back, turning towards us, and was hit by Velvet Remedy's anesthetic spell before she could speak, much less reload. She collapsed in front of the burning monster. A gaping pit opened in the black moss where the manticore's mouth should be, and it screamed silently, green fire burning up through the hole to consume its mockery of a head. Pyrolite landed on Velvet Remedy's head, looking particularly proud of herself. Sorry about that, Velvet apologized to the downed Pegasus. Beyond us, Lapalum was getting back to his hooves. He wobbled silently, the toll taken by the memory spell mixing with the heat and the smoke. The Twilight Society unicorn stumbled away from the Wonderbolt and towards a patch of ferns looking like he was about to pass out. A bulb-headed stalk rose up out of the ferns as he reached them, spraying its cloud of spores directly into the unicorn's face. I cried out in alarm, the scream tearing at my throat. But the sound was lost in the sudden conflagration as the alicorn's shield dropped and the fires, started by a skydive's flaming contrail, exploded outward to greet the fresher air. Night was falling in the Everfree Forest. We had managed to put at least a mile or two between ourselves and the fires. There was a hellish orange glow in the broiling sky above. The world below became all shadows against deeper darkness. Only the light from our horns, velvet remedies in mine, were truly lighting our way. Life Bloom doubled over again, retching. Bile and filth poured out of his mouth and nose. He had cast a purging spell on himself, trying to get rid of all those spores before they could settle down in him and slowly kill him. The effects were extremely unpleasant and debilitating, but far better than the alternative. 
We pushed through the forest. I floated Zenith next to me. Velvet Remedy was levitating the wounded albino hellhound. The monster had passed out, and Velvet had simply insisted, if we leave him, he'll burn alive. Calamity had insisted he be bound, and Velvet had at least relented on that. I wasn't sure how much good bindings would do on a huge monster with long, armor-slicing claws. The hellhound groaned. Zenith was utterly silent. We had managed to pull off Calamity's plan with three of the Wonderbolts. Jet, Skydive, and Strikewise, their heavy gunner. None of them had joined up with us, although Strikewise was admittedly, at least admitted it was, a lot to take in and a lot to think about, before she and Skydive left us. If there was a truce, it was unspoken. The Wonderbolt's two bucks, Lens Flare and Gunshot, were unaccounted for. From what little we know of each of them, I doubted Calamity's memories would be enough to alter either of their minds. Lens Flare was his eldest brother, his friend, and lover. The buck had yet to engage us directly. Gunshot on the other hoof. Whoa! Calamity whistled, pulling me out of my retrieve. Ahead of us, the Everfree Forest was filled with beautiful plants, which glowed a bioluminescent green. Pyrelight flew ahead, dancing among the plants, singing merrily. They grew along vines that wrapped around trees and snaked across the florist floor. Yes, Velvet chuckled to the Balefire Phoenix as Pyrelight swooped back to her, one of the flowers tucked into her feathers by the stem. It does go nicely with your plumage. What do you figure they are? Clemity asked as he flew cautiously into the area. Think they're safe? Personally, I wasn't ready to count anything in the Everfree Forest as safe. Safe-er, maybe, Reggie commented. I'll tell you what I ain't seen. Little vines of blue evil. That's cause... The hellhound rasped, startling us, all enough that Velvet remember Velvet's magic imploded, dropping him. He landed on the soft grass without a grunt. Phantasmal flowers are deadly to killing Gok. Deadly how? Lightbloom asked. The only one of us not focused entirely on the fact that a member of a race of vicious pony slayers had just woken up in our mists. I didn't want to have a conversation with this monster. The little pony in my head was screaming at me to launch it to the moon, or at least as high as I had sent those of its kind who murdered steel hooves. Feed off the same psychic energy, I think, the hellhound said, then barked as Calamity immediately retreated from the flowers. They's harmless. To dogs and ponies, I mean. But to kill and yoke, they're like weeds. In the worst way. We looked at each other. Reggie finally shrugged. Well, if you're willing to take the word of a one leg slice and dice. Without further words, she flew to the gently glowing stretch of the Everfree Forest. Velvet Remedy wrapped her magic around the Hellhound again, lifting him up. Uh, Velvet? Calamity asked, wondering just what she was doing. I can see not leaving him in the middle of a fire, but why don't we leave him here? Calamity gave, or Velvet gave Calamity a honey-sweet smile, which she slowly turned on the hellhound as she spoke. Because we should leave him someplace safe, and if in those flowers is as safe as he says, he wouldn't mind coming with us. Pony, the hellhound started, addressing Velvet as she floated him back off the ground. He was still bound, but I couldn't help but notice he hadn't really tested his restraints yet. Hell, he hadn't even tried. Why save me? Velvet Remedy replied without even having to think. Because you were hurt. Ponies don't heal, the hellhound countered. Ponies kill, destroy, take. Strange, Velvet retorted. That's what ponies say about hellhounds. 
Wonderful. Why don't we just poke the hellhound with a stick? Hey, Reggie called back to us, having gotten a bit ahead. There's, a uh, something up here. Moving forward beneath the glowing orange sky, we discovered a hollowed-out tree, almost as gnarled and twisted as Fluttershy's, draped in thick vines and glowing with hundreds of phantasmal flowers. At the foot of the tree, littered amongst the contorted roots, were ancient and fearsome wooden masks, carved in faces that looked demonic. Strange bottles and flasks hung from the branches, along with a wind chime made of bones. The phantasmal flowers spread out from the tree, like ripples from a stone dropped in the lake. Wait. I've seen this before. Places like this. In a dream. Shelter? Lifebloom suggested, hopefully. Or death trap? Our luck could go either way. Drink. Velda Remini commanded, with her usual bedside manner, as she lifted the bottle to the albino hellhound muzzles. Hellhound's muzzle. If you're waiting for sparkling water, you'll die of hydration first. The hollow tree was a refuge, a home crafted by zebra magic. The bottle brew had come from the refrigerator. Most of what was in the fridge had succumbed to mold, although not of the black and arbitrary kind. Only a few bottles remained unbroken, and theoretically safe. Look, I'll take a sip first, if it helps. Clemity gazed at the glowing green flowers whose vines embraced the ancient zebra home, almost as much inside as out, snicking about the decaying furniture and hanging from the ceiling. Beautiful and serenely eerie. There was an old terminal, long dead, amongst the rotting boards which had once been a desk, or possibly a bureau. The spark battery still had some magic left, and I was hoping I could jerry-rig a way to reboot my pit buck from the remains of the Arcano technology device. So, what all do you know about these here phantasmal flowers? Clamity asked. Vodermity hissed at him, eyes narrowing. Talking hellhounds weren't drinking hellhounds. What? Zebra plants used to make powders to conjure up frightening illusions, the hellhound told us. Never could get that to work ourselves, but mash them up just right, and they make a fine, green, glowing paste. He grinned, showing us lots of very sharp teeth. Slather it on an old sawhorse, covering a brahmin skins, and jerk it around on strings like a puppet, and watch the pony scream and run from the headless horse. Why would you do that? Velvet Remedy asked. Why would anyone be scared of that? Reggie wondered. The hellhound grinned again. Cause ponies are stupid. We all glared at him, except for Reggie, who was too busy snickering. Clemity muttered something about the stupidity of saving him, earning another dark look from Velvet. Finally, the hellhound offered. Not all dogs want to kill ponies. Most do. But some of us just want to be left alone. Scowling, he told us. Our alphas wanted war with the old ponies, and with the new ponies, and with the goddesses. So we left Meriponi to make our home made ghosts in the headless horse to scare ponies away. Well, better than having them shoot at us. That is, until you ponies flew up and one of your big black cloud boats and dropped that damn antenna into our yard. Made us all sit while you were putting those damned helmets on us, making us go where you want, kill who you want. My hoof hit my face. Perfect. The one group of hellhounds in the entire damned wasteland that might be friendly, and the enclave went in and fucked with their heads. All but Barking Saw, that old darg might have been the best eyes in the wasteland, 
but he's old and senile, and, best of all, stone deaf. Took out a mess of you ponies with his sniper rifle already, but he's still back at the farm, shooting any pony-shaped thing that pokes his head out. Well, that would be why the Wonderbolts used the solar hope array to hide in, rather than the farm itself. Why doesn't he just shoot the, up the broadcast array? I asked, as I tried futilely to make the terminal do something useful. The albino hellhound scowled at me. What part of deaf and senile don't you get? Ouch, Reggie whispered. I tossed aside my work, and the terminal in frustration, turning instead to a locked chest in the corner of the zebra home. It was metal and looked out of place, with the rest of the aged header decor. And unlike the terminal, I knew how to make the lock do what I wanted to. Out of nostalgia, I floated out a bobby pin and my screwdriver. Lava once again pestered the hellhound to drink, and I began to suspect her refusal, or his refusal, was more a game of piss off the pony to him than born of actual concern about the contents. Velvet, Lifebloom said, gently putting a hoof on her shoulder. We need to talk about Zenith. She hasn't woken up yet. The swelling is getting worse. If I'm going to use my, uh, tea plantation spell, I should do it now. The lock yielded to me without a fight. I lifted open the chest, looking inside. A stone plate with a carved inscription, an audio recording, and an oddly hued hunk of pockmarked rock. Everything else in the chest was decayed into slime and dust. The inscription on the stone was in an old pony script, like zebra glyphs, but using symbols including horns, lightning bolts, horseshoes, and unicorn busts. I had no idea what it said. Reggie looked over my shoulder, then called back. Hey, any of you know how to read pretentious? I snorted, quite sure that wasn't the proper name for the language. Uh, nope, Calamity said, sufficiently. Life Bloom and Velvet Remedy strode to look. When the five are present, a spark will cause the sixth to be revealed. Left Bloom read. It's talking about the elements of harmony, he said. A slight variation on a passage from the elements of harmony. A reference guide. Probably the original. From the look of the stone, this plate was part of the castle of the sisters. Then what's it doing here? I took a closer look at the chest, searching it until I found the gear-shaped StableTech logo stamped on the bottom corner. StableTech built a stable under the ruins of that castle, I mused. They must have torn quite a bit of it up to do so. I floated out of the auto recording, which in my pit, bag, pit leg worked, or at least the terminal. If none of you have a particular need for that stone, the Twilight Society would appreciate the right to claim it, Lightbloom said, before he and Velvet Remedy returned to discussing Zenith. Pfft. Reggie puffed. What would I want with a dumb rock? Too bad there isn't an element of snarkiness. The little pony in my head snarked back. I prefer decorations, and I can read myself, Calamity said, flying away to one of the windows. The memory that had slipped from my mental grasp earlier returned to dance in front of me. Velvet! I spun to face her. I think... I paused. Better slow down. This is by no means a sure thing. I believe there might, I stress, might, be a way to save Fluttershy. The beautiful unicorn mare's eyes opened wide, glistening with eager hope. How? she asked, followed promptly by, Can we do it now? There's a book I read, Supernaturals. It's full of old remedies, one of which is to reverse the transformations caused by something called Poison j Joke. 
I said carefully. I still have the book at Junction R7. Velvet Remedy smiled thankfully, but I was already having some serious doubts. And you think that will turn Fluttershy back into a pony? No, I admitted. I was sure that Killing Joke was a mutated, vicious cousin of the plant described in Supernaturals. But they were vastly different, even in their magical touch. The book said the transformations caused by Poison Joke occurred overnight, but Killing Joke infected its cruelty instantly, or, in the very least, it was a far more potent magic. Not as it is, but I think the recipe is the starting point for creating a cure. Velvet Remedy nodded, looking grimly determined, but still hopeful. And if I could, was this really a good idea? What if the cure turned Fluttershy back into a two-century-old pony? And even if she was restored physically to her prime, was there any chance her sanity would be intact? I reluctantly voiced my concerns to Velvet Remedy, only to be surprised by her resolve. If that's the case, then I will do what Fluttershy needs me to do, Velvet Remedy said flatly. But one way or another, her torture ends. The room fell quiet. A realization passed over Velvet's face. She turned to Life Bloom. Now it's not just my friend's life you hold in your horn, but the life of the greatest of ponies, too. She bit her lower lip. Zenith is the only one who knows enough about herbs and alchemy and magical plants to know how to create a new recipe from Little Pip's old one. Do what you have to do, and may the goddess's hooves guide you. Having said those words, Velvet Remedy slowly walked over towards where Calamity was standing, watching her. Her last steps faltered, and he moved to support her, holding her close. Calamity nuzzled the weary unicorn lovingly, then turned to stare out the window at this eerily beautiful patch of the Everfree Forest. His expression slowly hardened. Uh, folks, you better take a look at this. Footnote. Maximum level.